you've seen my video series on building the CPU and the computer documented in the elements of computing systems, you'll recognize this board. I use this board quite a bit because it has um, a lot of LEDs and a lot of switches on it, which makes it really nice to interact with logic. But um, the next step that I want to take with this project is to be able to introduce a display, a video display, and some sort of uh, keyboard, maybe mouse input. And so this, you know, this board and form factor doesn't really lend itself well to being able to develop something like that. And this board is actually two pieces. So you've got this top sort of hat board and you've got this main circuit board. So it's certainly possible to design your own custom board to be able to, you know, put some sort of, um, you know, VGA connector and USB connector and so forth. Um, another thing that you can get, which I do have, is this sort of prototyping board that's made for the Alcatry. So you can take this board that's right now, I've got some, just some pins, some pin headers soldered into it so that you can take a, a ribbon cable like this and plug this ribbon cable in and then, you know, run, run this ribbon cable over to a breadboard or something. And that works okay. You know, it mates, it mates up on top of the existing board sort of like so. So, you know, you could conceive of, if you wanted to put a, v a VGA interface on this board, you know, you could conceive of, and I did buy a VGA connector to, to maybe mount, let's say over here, except that when I ordered these, these pins here, which sorry if the focus is a bit off, but uh, these pins don't have the same layout. They're, they're slightly smaller than the pin layout. So if I line this up, you know, you can kind of see here, see the pins don't exactly line up. So that was kind of a bummer when I realized that. So what I did instead is I got one of these. which allows me to run jumper wires, you know, from VGA to something. Still though, it doesn't lend itself very well to interacting with this. I mean, again, you know, you could run jumper, jumpers from here over to here maybe, and you know, that might be okay, but I just didn't like it. So what did I do instead? I got this board that's made by Digilent. And this is a, a board that just has uh, pin headers on the bottom that you can just plug into a breadboard like a, I think it's 40 pins, like a 40 pin dip and be able to hook up, you know, I have my oscilloscope hooked up to it right now, but you know, you can hook up anything you want to it. So this makes this just a lot easier to experiment with. So we can hook this VGA connector up to this device. We could hook, you know, USB, whatever we wanted to, we could hook it up very easily. And then it even has a uh, pin header at here on top so that you could plug another board. You know, you can make a custom board and plug it in on top or even, you know, a, a custom board that you could just pop this out of and plug that into that's already got some, uh, you know, USB connectors that you could, drill out or something and, and, and mount on there. So uh, the remainder of the video series, most likely I'm going to wind up using this board. And of course, this board does not have a board design file in Logisim for it, uh, which I've gone on ahead and done. And I'll probably wind up checking in to the Logisim uh, maintainer so that they can add that to the product. So let's talk for a minute about the next steps of this project. The next, the next thing that I want to do is that I want to add a VGA interface. Uh, you know, I debated whether adding uh, maybe HDMI or composite or whatever, and uh, 
sort of landed, you know, composites too old. Nobody has a composite monitor. HDMI has its own complexities. It's, it's, it's doable. Uh, and I do probably want to do it, but, um, I decided that VGA is just sort of the simplest thing that's modern enough that people, you know, could still probably make use of. In order to put out a VGA signal, you need a pixel clock of a high enough frequency to get the frame rate that you want based upon the color depth. Well, color depth in our case is going to be black and white. If you, you know, look at the spec of the uh, Elements of Computing Systems book, it's a relatively low resolution and it's black and white, no, no, no grayscale even. So the clock rate can be fairly low given the re resolution that it's at. And so I've sort of settled on 12 megahertz pixel clock. I chose that also because if we implement USB, USB, the slow speed or the slower speed, I guess, is uh, also clocked at 12 megahertz. So we can use the same clock for both VGA and for USB. So that seemed logical. Now, uh, this board, this uh, digital board has an onboard 12 megahertz clock already on it. And of course, you know, it's got USB, so that would make sense that the clock that's on it is already running at 12 megahertz. But that gets us into a bit of a problem if, we're, if we want to use Logisims. So let's create a simple circuit that simply outputs the clock. And we'll make that an output, and we'll just output the clock to a pin. So here we can see the Digilent uh, CMOD A7 board that I showed you on my breadboard. Uh, this, this does not exist in the current version of Logisim, but I will make a pull request so that uh, hopefully the developers can include it. Uh, but let's, let's simply create a divider value of one. And um, we see here that there's a frequency displayed of six megahertz. So let's see what happens. So we'll map our output to this first uh, pin here on our board. Okay, the design is synthesized. Well, let's load the design. And I use this utility from Digilent, I think, the design can probably be loaded from Logisim because Vivado probably, I think Vivado supports loading it natively and Logisim thus probably can do it, but I haven't um, messed with the settings enough to know exactly how to get it to work. It currently doesn't work for me, but this utility does work fine. So let me plug in the board to my laptop and we should get, yeah, there's the CMOD A7 now. So now we'll hit program. And so as we program, this is what should happen. And there we go. So as you can see, my scope is showing a waveform of one and a half megahertz. Question you might have is that there's a 12 megahertz crystal on the board. The dialog showed six megahertz. And yet the clock signal and, and, and with a, one um one x div divider value why do we see a megahertz one and a half megahertz we should see six right uh, well first of all the frequency that is displayed let me go back to the dialogue here this frequency that's displayed is actually not the clock frequency even though it says clock settings and i i find this confusing about logisim Frankly, uh, this frequency is actually the tick frequency. It's not the it's not the clock frequency. The clock frequency is actually one half of this. So we would expect to see a three megahertz clock uh, on our scope, but of course, instead we see we see that which is a megahertz, one and a half megahertz. So why is that? Well, authors of Logisim steal another set of clock ticks for some synchronization purposes. I don't even understand why. Uh, it's actually explained on, a, on an issue that I've filed 
Uh, and they, they sort of explained it, but they didn't really explain it in, in detail. And I haven't really delved into the code to kind of figure out why. But the bottom line is, if you put a divider value of 1 in, you have to divide this, what's displayed here, by factor 4 to get what you, what you expect the clock frequency to do. Anything greater than 1. So if you put a 2 in or a 4 in or whatever, whatever value you see here to get the clock frequency, you divide that this value by 2. The fastest clock frequency that you can apply to a design in Logisim for this board, for this uh, CMOD A7 board, is 1.5 megahertz. And so, obviously, for what I want to do, it's not going to work. So, you know, you have a couple of options. You can put another clock. You know, you can buy another physical clock uh, oscillator and, and attach it to the board and uh, use that. But there is another alternative. So what we're looking at here is the clock resource guide for the 7 Series chips made by Xilinx, which the Artix 7 is the chipset that is on the uh, Digilent board. And so this guide talks about uh, resources that are on the board for dealing with clocks. So. Let's scroll down here a little bit and read a little bit from the from the data sheet and get some a little bit more background as to what this is. Uh, let me blow this up so it's easier to read here. So, seven series FPGA clock resource manager, complex and simple clocking requirements with dedicated global and regional I.O. and clocking resources. Clock management tiles, CMT, provide clock frequency synthesis, DSKU, jitter filtering functionality. The key element here actually is clock frequency synthesis, because ultimately what we want to do is synthesize a new clock, a faster clock than what we're putting into the chip in the first place. So I'm going to scroll down. There's a bunch of detail here. But let's start here. CMT overview. Each 7 Series FPGA has up to 24 CMTs, or clock management tiles, each consisting of one MMCM and one PLL. MMCMs and PLLs serve as frequency synthesizers for a wide range of frequencies, serve as jitter filters, and DSKU clocks. The PLL contains a subset of the MMCM functions, 7 Series FPGA clock input connectivity allows multiple resources to provide the reference clocks to the MMCM and, and PLL. And then it says here, the clock, the Logic, the Logic Core IP clocking wizard is available to assist in utilizing the MMCM and PLL to create clock network, networks in 7 Series FPGA designs. Uh, the GUI interface is used to collect clock net, network parameters. Clocking wizard chooses the appropriate CMT resource and optimally configures the CMT and associated clock routing resources. Now, obviously we have Logisim. We do not, you know, we do not have this tool, but the good news is, is that there are primitives that you can program that are documented in this, in this uh, right up here that uh, you can program using VHDL and Logisim behind the scenes to generate, to synthesize your design outputs VHDL and also Verilog. And so uh, that implies that Logisim can be modified to output a VHDL file that hooks into the clock chain to be able to speed up the clock. So this manual is 114 pages long. We're obviously not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to show you a couple of relevant pages. Um, you don't have to, you know, as, um, as Ben Eater says, uh, there's a great deal of precision, but not a lot of clarity. <laughs> so you could read 114 pages, uh, and maybe still not get the important bits out of it that you need, because you need to know what important bits to find. And believe me, I spent a lot of time reading it to try to understand what this is saying. So you can learn perhaps from my struggles. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Oh, here we go. So page, page 66, middle of the document, clock management tile, right? Uh, so let's look at this diagram here first. This is high, high, high level. So there's a PLL, phase lock loop, and 
MMCM, very basically what you can see, we provide the MMCM with a, an input clock. We provide it with some sort of feedback. That's what this FB means. And the feedback is useful for, de for performing DSKU operations if you want that on the clock. And the clock in, it goes through this multiplexer uh, that can be one of these, what is this, six different sources. These are buffers themselves. So uh, R is regional, G is global, H is, I think, horizontal. So these buffers speak to essentially where on the chip the clock can be provided, uh, right? You know, global buffer means the synthesizer does some mass, some magic behind the scenes to make sure that the clock, the, the clock globally is available with very, very little uh, latency through all components of the chip. Of course, it's a much heavier resource, as I might imagine, versus a regional buff, uh, buffer versus probably a horizontal buffer. Uh, we'll use a global buffer for to, just to keep things simple. But basically, you have these kinds of buffered inputs that can then feed into one or two different uh, base input clocks. Then a whole bunch of settings you can do in here, which don't really show, but we'll show that in a second. And then on the output side, you get another buffer uh, or hook up another buffer to uh, your output. So let's look at this diagram now. This gives a much better detailed view of what goes on inside the MMCM block. So as mentioned, you've got clock input circuitry and you've got this feedback. Uh, then you have these, these are, these are blocks that, that can be configured by various parameters. Um, ultimately, you uh, will set uh, multi multipliers and dividers uh, in order to be able to synthesize up to what looks like uh, seven different clock out frequencies, right? So pretty cool. One mm, uh, one mmcm block diagram can result in uh, all of these different frequencies. Now these these can be these can be different frequencies, like different synthesized frequencies, or they can be the same frequency at just different phases, right? So you have a lot of flexibility as far as uh, what you can output with one of these MMCM tiles. For our purposes, we're, all I really want is just a new clock, a new newly synthesized clock at a higher frequency. So a lot of this is going to be wasted, but uh, Logisim doesn't really take advantage of any of these. Uh, the various Arctic or the various um, Series Seven chips from Xilinx all have different numbers of CMTs. That's you know, different memory, different CMTs, different uh, number of LUTs. All you know, that's basically what you're buying when you buy these different lines of chips. But all of them, the set on the Seven Series, all of them have at least one uh, clock management tile that you can use to synthesize frequencies with. So there are two different primitives. Basically, think of them as libraries that you can program against in order to manipulate the clock management tile. Uh, there's an advanced, it, I think base and advanced is what this refers to. Uh, advanced gives you a lot more control over uh, what you can do with the various clocks. We don't need this kind of control. So I stuck with using the MMCM base library because basically you just need to provide a clock in and you need to provide a couple of parameters which aren't really shown here and then you get the clock out and that's really about it. So let's look at some of this, uh, some of these settings. So this is page uh, 70. And again, the links to this documents I'll put in, uh, in the comments. Uh, page 70. So these are the ports that uh, the MMCM base take. Let's just look at these. So clock in, obviously that's the, you know, input from the clock that's on the board. Uh, reset sounds important. So obviously we want reset to not be, we want the MMCM to not be in reset. So we're going to have to set this appropriately in order to make sure that's, that's the case. Uh, 
Uh, our clock, our synthesized clock, is going to be one of these based upon probably some setting, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, locked. Locked speaks to whether or not the clock is locked in and running, I suppose. And then uh, power down uh, most likely is a um, probably low power type setting that you can do to tell the clock management tile that uh, you don't want to put it in reset, but you want it to go into a low power state. So this is a fairly important page here. Um, so page 72 talks about how some of these parameters work. So this first formula here speaks about the VCO, that's the voltage controlled oscillator frequency. That's Think of that as the internal frequency that the chip will synthesize for you from which other frequencies can be derived. And typically this needs to be a fairly high frequency uh, in order to get accurate lower frequencies. And so there are a couple of parameters that you specify in order to be able to attain a voltage controlled oscillator frequency internal to the chip. And there are some ranges that that VCO must be in. And in fact, there is a range that the clock in must be in as well in order for this to work. These things are documented in a table that we'll look at here below. But suffice it to say that the VCO has got to be a certain in a certain range, and that range is based upon the frequency of the input clock and then uh, M divided by D. Uh, and these are this, these M and D parameters are values that you can set on the MMCM base library, if you will. Then, in order to get a specific output clock. Uh, there are there's an additional parameter that you can specify, uh, an additional uh, division parameter for each uh, output that's available on the MMCM. Remember, I said there were seven, or maybe it was eight. I can't remember. There's there's a bunch of different outputs on the MMCM, and each one of those outputs can then be configured with an, with its own divisor, basically dividing the frequency of the VCO further down into whatever frequency that you need it to be. So here's a little example, it's on page 73, of a 33 megahertz reference input clock. So our VCO is oscillating at 33 megahertz times M divided by D, which is 1. So 33 megahertz times 32 is, what is that? That's a gigahertz or something? Um, I think it says, a, yeah, it says right here. So our VCO is operating at... Um, 1056 megahertz. And so each one of the other divisors is set in this manner. And in and in this case, you know, there's a little synopsis here of what it is that they're they're trying to synthesize. You know, they they need a they want a processor clock and a gasket clock and a memory interface clock and all sorts of different clocks. So in order to obtain those clocks, they specify a different value for O, which again, O is this divisor here, right? Is that divisor. And so, you know, here, if, uh, you know, this is a good example. So we have a multiplier of 32 and a divisor of 32. So therefore we should get back because D is one, we should get back the reference clock, which we do here. That's what this is indicating. So anyway, this is, in our case, all we're going to do, uh, all I want to do is that I want to expose this M value and this D value exposed on the Logisim interface so that I can feed these into a clock management tile to get a voltage control oscillator frequency high enough to then be able to apply, um, you know, a pre you know, one of these values or maybe just defaulted to a value of one and then allow the other divisor value that's already on the Logisim interface to basically subdivide it down to, you know, the frequency that, that you're after. So something that's important to note on setting the M and the D values and well, which, which of course ultimately yields in the VCO, the voltage controlled oscillator frequency, is that there are absolute mins and maxes for all of these values, right? So uh, for example, the input frequency from the board 
to the MMCM has to be 10 megahertz or better. Uh, it actually says that somewhere in the document. I can't remember exactly where, but I do know that's the case. And actually my code edits for that, by the way. So if you try to feed on a clock, so you might you might have asked yourself early on in the video, well, Chuck, why didn't you just use the built-in VHDL capability that's provided by Logisim and just hang that off of the clock that's provided to you uh, to, to step the frequency up? Well, if you'll recall, this particular board, the best frequency that you can get out of it from Logisim is uh, one and a half megahertz. Well, that's less than 10 megahertz. And there is an absolute minimum of the input clock that you can feed to the VCO to be able to get uh, stepped up frequencies. And that that is 10 megahertz. So that's why I didn't implement it that way. Uh, second thing is the M and the Ds have certain ranges. So you can see the division in this case, uh, 1, to, 1 to 128 in increments of 0.125. And uh, the M value 2 to 64 in increments of 0.125. So there are, and then there's the D, uh, there's the, the overall D value. These values that I showed up here were the, the individual O values, which we're actually not using because we're using the one provided by Logisim. But my point here is that there are maxes and mins to these parameters as defined in this table. But further, there are maxes and mins as defined by the formula that you use to get the VCO in the first place. And the all of that math is sort of defined here in in these tables. But the notion, but the but the point here, I believe, is that the VCO needs to be somewhere between 600 megahertz and 1600 megahertz in order to be able to derive the other frequencies that you're interested in. Now, I'm not sure whether this these are the absolute mins and maxes. I'd have to go look in the documentation more closely to see if that's the case or whether they just did this for an example. Um, but there's definitely a min and max VCO that you need to attain. And the point is that you're trying to get the greatest VCO that you can get while specifying, actually it says it right here, the goal is to find the M value closest to the ideal operating point of the VCO. The minimum D value is used to start the process. The goal is to make M and D values as small as possible while keeping v, uh, FVCO as high as possible. So this is kind of what you have to do uh, while getting the VCO probably as close to 1600 megahertz as possible uh, while minimizing those M and those D values. Now, if you, if you screw that up, what's ultimately going to happen in Logisim is that when you synthesize it, uh, you're going to get a synthesis failure. And the messages are fairly straightforward since you now know that these values have, you know, do have some limitations on them. So it may take a bit of experimentation. Also know that the clock wizard that's built into Vivado, which I did not show and I'm not going to show, uh, does attempt to calculate these values for you. So if you get stuck, you can run Vivado. I personally don't find Vivado very intuitive or user friendly but I have used the clocking wizard and it does work. If you can find it, it's buried. Uh, and you know, you can then uh, get the M and the D values uh, that route as well. But I'd say just try trial and error. And I think, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. Okay, let's run this again. What I'm running now is a custom version of Logisim. So this code, I've made modifications in this code has been pushed out to GitHub to the uh, Logisim um, developers, uh, the, the Logisim uh, GitHub site under the develop branch. And I've made a pull request. Uh, so we'll see if the maintainers uh, think this is worthy uh, of incorporating into the base product. I tried to make it generic and uh, reusable and, and in keeping with how they code the project. So let's take our design. Again, let's just draw that up real quick. And let's again synthesize the design. Now you'll notice here is our pre-multiplier, our M value, if you will. Here is our pre-divider. So let's um, 
put in some values like so. And actually, remember what I said before, anything, anything one, so if the value is one, uh, the clock frequency is actually going to be half of what's shown divided by half again. And so um, any, any other value, you're going to get a clock frequency that's actually half of what is shown here, because this is the tick frequency, not the clock frequency. And remember what I was saying, I'm actually out to try to get a 12 megahertz clock. So in theory, if everything that I said is true, these settings should result in a 12 megahertz clock. So let's annotate our design. Map our pin and synthesize. Uh, did we get it? Yeah, so we got uh, no errors, no, okay. So that looks good. Let's load our design and see what we get. Now let's uh, switch over to our scope and board. Got everything hooked up. Yeah, it looks like it. So I'm gonna hit the program button. And, uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, 11 point, yeah, 11.9. Let me expand the uh, the range here. So we get, yeah, so we get better waveform and we can see it's spot on 12 megahertz, exactly what we expect it to be. Uh, of course, overshoot and undershoot and ringing and all that, but we don't, you know, don't really care about that. We, we're getting a very clean and stable uh, 12 megahertz by, by the looks of it. Now you might ask yourself, well, that's great, Chuck, but what happens if I don't have one of these? Uh, let me flip over so I can, so <laughs> you can see. What happens if I don't have one of these uh, Xilinx series chips? What happens? Well, what's going to happen at least at this point is when you pick a board that is that does not have an uh, an art a a Xilinx 7 Series chip in it, the dialog is basically going to change back to the way it used to look. And, and you're not going to be able to provide the M and the D parameter. They're basically going to default to 1. And in fact, behind the scenes, and I'm going to show you here in a bit, uh, the component that's generated basically just loops back the input clock to the clock tree that Logisim makes for you under the covers anyway. So it, it basically that doesn't write any sort of clock management anything if you pick a board that is that is not supported. Now, when I say not supported, what I mean by that is while your board and your chip may support clock management of some kind, I haven't gone through all of the chips that are supported by the Logisim tool to try to discern, well, you know, is there is there a clock synthesizer and are there primitives we can program, blah, blah, blah. You know, that that's left as an exercise to other readers that have other boards, but I did design the software in a way that it makes it um, fairly easy to extend if uh, somebody wants to take on the task to do it. And I will show you, let's let's go in and look at a little bit of the code. This is not really meant to be a Logisim internals discussion, but for those of you that may be curious, uh, let's, you know, I'll show you a few things. What I wanted to show you and uh, what you're looking at here is the synthesized clock generator component. This this Verilog file, and um, quick note, my settings were set to generate Verilog in Logisim. Uh, you can go into settings in Logisim and change that to VHDL, and I think that is actually the default. That's what I use most of the time, but in this case, I was testing Verilog just to make sure that it produced Verilog correctly. And, you know, for the purposes of this discussion, it um, doesn't really matter whether we use Verilog or VHDL, because I'm just going to show you kind of the primitives at work and how they're specified. Um, but you can see here that the synthesized clock generator takes an input, which is the basically the input clock from the board, and it outputs a synthesized clock. 
which makes sense, right? Because we're trying to step up the frequency. And if we go down here, what we see is, remember those two buffers that we talked about, these global buffers. So we're going to buffer the, uh, we're going to buffer the, um, the output clock, and we're going to buffer the input clock because that's what the MMCM primitive required you to do. Um, so then here you can see the three parameters um, of the uh, of, of utilizing the MMCM base component, right? So there's the clock in parameter, which is defining the frequency or sorry, the period in nanoseconds of the input clock. So 12 megahertz clock uh, is 83.333 nanoseconds, period. And then here are the multiplier and divider values that we specified. You know, this 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 is the code that, that the design generated that I just showed you. So here are our two, uh, here's an M and our D parameter specified as parameters on this MMCM primitive. Uh, MMCM base primitive. Uh, and so now you can see all the port mappings. So for reset and power down, those are active high signals. So we don't want to be in reset and we don't want to be powered down. So we send a binary zero, one bit of binary zero to those. Our clock in is going to be our buffered FPGA clock, which again up here is uh, in I clock buff. You can see the FPGA clock which is from the actual input to this module. And out of that, we get a buffered FPGA clock, which is what clock in then is, is uh, mapped into. Uh, now this feedback, you can see here that I use the same signal to provide feedback in and feedback out. So basically we're just looping back the feedback, providing what is essentially no feedback. Uh, feedback is required. But if you don't require any for de-skewing purposes or other reasons, you can basically just provide the same uh, signal to, to bring the out back into the in. And that's, that's what this is doing. This other port here, then clock out zero. So this is the first output. And you'll notice that all the rest of them don't have anything. And Verilog, you have to specify all the ports uh, in Verilog, even if you don't route anything to them, or you'll get a complaint. So that's why all of these are listed here, even though we're not using them. Note in VHDL, you don't have to do that. Um, but in any case, uh, so in he so here, we're mapping the clock out port to the unbuffered synthesized clock, which again goes to this buffer, whereby we are taking that unbuffered synthesized clock wire as the input to this global buffer. And then on the output, we get synthesized clock. And then you can see here, uh, signal, that's what the S means, signal synthesized clock is mapped to the output port synthesized clock. Let's just take a little bit of a peek at the code that generates this so you can see where in Logisend this is generated. So in the HDL, HDL generator subdirectory. What you will find this is a new this is a new class that I added uh, called uh, Xilinx Series Seven Synthesized Clock Generator Factory, and the constructor takes the base FPGA clock frequency. It takes the M value and it takes the D value, and as you might expect, what this is going to do this is going to actually generate the HDL code that we that we were just looking at. It generates both Verilog and VHDL code. What you see here are Logisim libraries that allow you to specify wires and uh, mappings to those wires to so, so that the code, the actual uh, HDL code can be written generically, regardless of whether it's Verilog or HDL. Uh, that, the, in some cases, you can abstract away the particular code that you're trying to get this generator to write by using the library that the developers of Logisim have provided for you. However, you'll see here, this is actual, in this case, VHDL that is being written here, which of course I did not show. I only showed the Verilog version, but if you switch Logisim over to VHDL, then this is the VHDL that's gonna get generated. This is actual VHDL because there aren't 
APIs within Logisim that can genericize all this stuff. At least I don't think there are. I kind of followed the example that I saw with other components uh, and sort of basically just did what they did. Uh, and down here, this should look familiar. This is the Verilog code. Now, obviously, this class has to be instantiated somewhere, and you know the code's got to be written out and sort of in the chain of what Logisim is provided for the clock. So there are a few other components that are generated uh, for the purposes of the clock. And, and this component is sort of inserted into the clock chain. So the top level HDL generator, this class, is where the component that I just showed you, along with the Logisim clock components, all get assembled and generated. So down in here, if we do, if we go look at, uh, let's come up to the top and then what we have here is uh, my synthesized clock HDL generator factory. So this is an instance variable. The top level HDL generator factory class, which is not the class that I added, this was already part of Logisim. Uh, I did modify it so that you send in whatever synthesized clock frequency generator factory you want it to operate on, which means that you can have different ones of these. So this is a base class, but you can have, you can implement your own class for your own chip die that's made by a different manufacturer if you want, uh, of which when you do that, you would inherit this class into your own custom class, which is basically what this does. As you can see, synthesize clock generator HDL factory right here. So here's my base class. Here's my Xilinx Series 7 class, right? When this class is instantiated, you send it which vendor's version you want it to use, and it'll just generate it. It doesn't care uh, what vendor that it, that it gets. So then you may ask, okay, so where... Uh, where's the determination made and how is this how is this class instantiated? Well, the answer to that question is it's in this file called or this class called download base. Again, it's in the download directory. So but if we uh, look at synthesizers, it's sort of in the middle of the file. This is this this class already existed. I, I modified it and added to it um, the, this bit of code here which is the code that knows what type of synthesized clock generator to instantiate based upon the chip that you've defined through the board information viewer uh, in the Logisim application. So you're gonna specify the technology. And, and so in this case, this is where Artix-7 would get put on the, the board tool. Uh, you know, you'd say Artix-7. And uh, vendor, this, this is going to be Vivado. And so you specify those two things, and those get sent into this uh, static method that actually does the determining. This is a factory that's going to figure out, well, which one of these synthesized clock generator factories do you want based upon what chip that you, that you told me that you have on your, uh, on your board. So here is that method right here. And as you can see, it's just very simple. It looks at hyphen seven at the end, and it looks for Vivado. And I do have this clock scaling requested flag because if you have a chip that is supported by this, but you specify an M and a D of one, I don't waste, I, I try not to waste MMCM resources by trying to scale the clock to the frequency that you already have. I simply uh, just uh, set this clock scaling request to false, and then that way you will you will basically get the base class, and all the base class does is it just does a loop back from the input clock to the output clock. Otherwise, it returns you an instantiated version of the Xilinx uh, class that, that I showed you. And presumably, if you wanted to add your board with your particular silicon uh, to support whatever version of clock management it has, you would simply put an if-else in here uh, 
with your new class uh, implementing your Verilog and your VHDL uh, as appropriate. So I hope you found that useful. Uh, it was a lot of detail, I know, and m many may not r really care, but I find it, I, I like understanding a bit about how the internals of these applications work, uh, serves to confirm that this stuff is actually is not magic, even though it seems to be. <laughs> so it provides such nice feature and capability and abstracts away from all of the minutia required to make the stuff work. But um, understanding a bit about the internals, I think is useful. So uh, what I uh, also finally, final thing I wanted to show you is that uh, I have a pull request. So this is the Logisim Evolution site. I have a pull request out here for the work that I did. Uh, and uh, it, it's teed up and ready to go. It's, uh, it's sitting on the develop branch right now. So, you know, if you have a need for this before the uh, maintainers pull this in, assuming they do, uh, you can go out here and uh, apply this uh, patch or this uh, this ticket to your own version of develop if you would like uh, to be able to use the capability. So uh, I hope you find that useful. And so now uh, I can proceed with the remainder of my content in order to work on my next project, which is to build an FPGA port to display some data from our elements of computing systems computer. Thanks for watching.